Welcome to CBS Sports HQ presented by Jersey Mike's. A sub above. I'm Jenny Dell. She's Amanda Guerra. We're happy to be here on the CBS Sports desk together. Now we're just one day away from the start of the NCAA tournament. The first four kicking off tomorrow. Amanda, it almost feels surreal. It really does. And by the way, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Thank I like you. your green. I like mine as well. So last St. Patrick's Day, we were probably all crying in our beers. Our green beers may be very <laughs> sad uh, that the tournament was canceled and quarantine, of course, was just beginning. But now we can raise a toast to the teams and the players that we do get to watch. The NCAA tournament is the brightest stage for the youngest stars in basketball. Some of the greatest of all time defined by carrying their teams to a national title. There was Kareem in the 60s, then known as Lou Alcindor, and Bill Walton in the 70s for UCLA. Of course, you had Magic and the Spartans, Danny Manning and the Jayhawks, Glenn Rice and the Wolverines. In the 90s, it was Ed O'Bannon with UCLA, 2000s Mello with Syracuse, and Kemba Walker with UConn. So who in this year's tournament is capable of making a similar run? Could it be Jalen Suggs for the Gonzaga Bulldogs? Suggs is almost certainly headed for the NBA draft, and he's going to be looking to put on a show for Gonzaga, looking for their first national title. Might it be the likely number one overall pick in the upcoming NBA draft, Cade Cunningham for Oklahoma State. Cunningham can flat out fill it up while doing so efficiently, making the Cowboys a very tough out. What about Jared Butler and Baylor? The junior guard is the heart and soul for the high-powered Bears. Could it be likely National Player of the Year Luca Garza with Iowa? The big man has a full trophy chest and came back for his senior season to win it all for the Hawkeyes. Or could it be the electric point guard for Illinois, Io DeSumo? Certainly playing his best basketball at the perfect time. Any of these players capable of leading their teams to a championship. But might it be someone unexpected? That's what March is all about, and the madness is about to begin. We cannot wait. Let's welcome in college basketball writer Chip Patterson. All right, Chip, tomorrow the Force Four gets underway. We are ready to dance, more than ready. So we're going to go through a lot here, uh, but we're going to start with a player to watch because they're the favorites like Luca Garza, Cade Cunningham, but you are going with someone who's becoming a fan favorite and a favorite here at HQ. Oh, without a doubt. It's Illinois guard Io DeSumo, uh, somebody who at the middle of the season when Big Ten play got underway, you just started to recognize that when it's winning time, Brad Underwood puts the ball in DeSumo's hands. Io DeSumo is the best closer in college basketball, and what stage in the sport is better for closers than the NCAA tournament when key buckets carry so much pressure, where a win carries you on to the next round and a loss sends you home. He welcomes all of that pressure. He welcomes that stage and he really seems to thrive. And so as we've seen throughout the Big Ten Conference Tournament, throughout the Big Ten regular season, Io DeSumo is just somebody you cannot take your eyes off of. And it's interesting because even within the context of that Illinois team, he's not always uh, going to be the star player for every single possession as Kofi Coburn is just so dominant down low. Andre Corbello has proven to be a real spark plug coming off the bench. But again, when it comes down to the moments that are going to define whether Illinois wins or loses. There's, the ball is going to be in the hands of the first team All-American, Io DeSumo. And he looks like a superhero, which is probably the coolest thing about it. All right, let's talk about a potential Cinderella team here, Chip. Um, back in 2018, of course, we had Sister Jean, Loyola Chicago, made it to the Final Four as an 11 seed. They're headed back. So is Sister Jean. They're an eight seed this year. So I'm not sure if it's them or possibly somebody else. Who could be a Cinderella team? So I'm drifting over to the Ohio Bobcats from the MAC. And the big reason for that, uh, number one, has to do with Jason Preston. Because what Ohio has is a legitimate NBA player at point guard. He's a 6'4", playmaking guard, does a great job of making reads, distributing the ball, and being able to be, as you see right there, a dynamic scorer. And so when I think about what a Cinderella needs, a Cinderella needs to have a player who can take over when all of a sudden everybody else is 
starting to get a little bit tight when everybody else is wondering, okay, are we going to be able to actually beat Virginia? Are we going to be able to actually beat Creighton to be able to make it to the Sweet 16? And Jason Preston has the kind of NBA talent that makes me think that he's going to be able to go and take over. They absolutely rolled through most of their opponents in the MAC. They were cut above everybody else. And that's a big reason why I like the Bobcats to be able to make it into the second weekend. Chip, give me an upset for the first round. Um, highly doubt it's going to be a 16 seed upsetting one scene. We've only seen that one time in history back in 2018. But what is a realistic upset you think we could see? Amanda, you'll be interested in this because I am going horns down. I've got Abilene Christian taking down Texas in the first round. Uh, they, speaking of rolling through your conference, uh, Abilene Christian absolutely crushed everybody in the Southland. They were, I mean, putting up like 88 to 53 kind of scores. They've got a top 30 defense nationally, including one of the best three point field goal percentage defenses in the entire country. They turn opponents over, they play at a fast pace. And I think that when we've got this Texas team that just Winning the Big 12 Conference Tournament just seems like a huge accomplishment. It just seems like real validation for Shaka Smart and this squad. And I think that they might get a very, very hungry in-state rival here in the 314 matchup. We don't always see it there, but Joe Golding's Abilene Christian Wildcats are absolutely capable of causing real problems. Just look at what they did this year because they challenged themselves. They played Texas Tech in December. December, only lost by seven. They played Arkansas in December, only lost by 13. They have played, you know, three seeds, six seeds in the NCAA tournament. They know what they need to do in order to win. And I think they might catch Texas sleeping here in the first round. All right, Chip Patterson, hang on just a second. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, Why we do, we want to remind you that you can find your bracket on CBSSports.com. Make sure to print it off. Get in the game. There's a chance to win a lot of cool stuff. CBSSports.com forward slash bracket. We'll be back in 60 seconds. Welcome back to CBS Sports HQ. It is time for your Naismith Watch presented by Jersey Mike's, a sub above. All right, so taking a look, these are the semifinalists, but of course, we like to predict things here on HQ. And for that, we bring in our college basketball writer, Chip Patterson. Chip, out of those finalists, who do you think should win? I think it should be Luca Garza, and you don't want to overthink this because whether it's Io DeSumo, Jalen Suggs, you know, we've seen lots of other players really be able to step up their game here in the important parts of the season. But you cannot argue with the entire body of work here. 23.7 points per game, 8.8 rebounds. I mean, the guy has uh, so many moves down low. And the thing that I want to talk about, especially with Garza in the context of this season, is what he's done to improve himself and try and become a three-point shooter that opposing defenses have to respect, not just somebody who works down on the block. And so uh, already pretty good on the offensive end uh, in the paint. For him to be able to add a little bit of an out outside shooting element, I think makes him really dynamic and helped him to be one of the most prolific scorers for one of the best teams in the country, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, It's got to be Luca Garza. Chip, let's continue with the first round here. Uh, I need to ask you a personal question. Do you fill out your bracket quickly or do you take your time? 30 minutes and it's in and on cbssports.com. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's for the expert bracket. That's how much time we've got. So I start off uh, before the bracket is announced and I've got my plus teams, my neutral teams and my minus teams. And so if a plus and a minus fall against each other, boom, that's an easy decision for me. I fill it out. I ride it the entire way. It gets a little bit reckless. I've got some crazy upsets and you can check it all out at cbssports.com. Okay, so the reason I ask, I want to ask your most difficult game to pick in round one. Um, I pull my hair out, I, I fill it out, I walk away, I come back. So what is your most difficult game to pick or that you did had to pick uh, in round one there? It's Colorado and Georgetown and it is all sentiment. It is because I love, capital L, love the Patrick Ewing leading Georgetown to the NCAA tournament, uh, doing it by winning in Madison Square Garden, winning the Big East Conference tournament, uh, doing it from uh, being predicted to be one of the worst teams in the Big East, having a low seed. I, I want to pick Georgetown 
to go to the next round. I want to pick Georgetown to win. Amanda, this is the first game of the round of 64, 12-15 on Friday. The entire world will be tuned in to see Patrick Ewing in Georgetown against Colorado. And the reason that is the most difficult game to pick is I'm picking Colorado. I just think they're the better team. I think they are great defensively. McKinley Wright, the fourth, gives the Buffs a real game changer who can put the game into his hands. Uh, if it does end up getting close late, you always want to find those kind of guards, especially when they are seniors and veterans. Colorado is going to try to make this game ugly. McKinley Wright can really help them win it. And so it was a difficult game for me to pick because my heart says Georgetown, but my head says Colorado. And so as much as I love the Patrick Ewing story, I do think it ends after one game in the NCAA tournament. First, he is disrespected at Madison Square Garden, but you're basically a security guard there. Now he's disrespected no. by Chip Patterson. I cannot believe that. Um, but, but like you said, you know, you have to go with what your head says. All right. So speaking of coaches, we focus so much on the players, the teams as a whole. Give us your favorite coaching matchup in the first round. Oh, that is without a doubt going to be Loyola against Georgia Tech because to borrow from our friends Gary Parish and Matt Norlander on the Ion College Basketball Podcast, they have four region by region previews that you should absolutely go and download. They're great uh, for any task that you've got. But they said this is the meeting of the most earnest coaches in college basketball. Porter Moser for Loyola, Josh Pastner for Georgia Tech. These guys are just good guys and you want to root for them both. and. They are both excellent X's and O's, particularly on the defensive side. Uh, I think that Loyola is the kind of team that if Loyola goes on to play Illinois in the second round, that is a tough matchup for the Fighting Illini. They're a top 10 team in Ken Palm. They're great schematically in terms of how they mix things up. And Josh Pastner has done an incredible job developing this Georgia Tech team. Jose Alvarado, uh, ACC Defensive Player of the Year, someone who was very, very lightly recruited. Now, you know, Moses Wright, the ACC Player of the Year. He only had one other offer, and that was to Catawba College. He'd only played one year of high school ball at Inlow High School here in Raleigh. So Josh Pastner, Porter Moser, they're both excellent X's and O's. They're both excellent player development. And they're just great guys. So I'm, I'm fascinated, hate that one has to lose, but it's my favorite coaching matchup of the first round. All right, let's jump to the second round. It starts this Sunday, the 21st. What's a matchup you'd like to see here? I want to see Michigan and LSU. Oh my goodness, LSU has the scores to really be able to push Michigan in a way that will allow us to know whether the Wolverines can overcome the loss of Isaiah Livers. Uh, it, Without Isaiah Livers in the lineup last two seasons, Michigan is a game below 500. With him in the lineup, they're 33 and seven. His impact is without a doubt, the biggest storyline around the Wolverines. Before his injury, he led the team in minutes played. And LSU, you know, with Cam Thomas, uh, Trina Watford, Javante Smart, they could really, really push Michigan in a way that I think will give us a preview of what might happen should Michigan make it into the Final Four and face a team like Gonzaga that we know is elite offensively. Uh, I just think that it's going to be a fun game. It would be a high scoring game. And for what it could tell us about Michigan or the kind of chaos that might happen, because I do think LSU could outscore Michigan. Now, LSU defensively is a little bit questionable. And if Michigan wants to turn it into a rock fight and use Hunter Dickinson to beat up on the Tigers, then Michigan wins that game. But a high scoring back and forth between Michigan and LSU, get your popcorn ready. I would love to see it. Chip, speaking of Michigan and LSU, you're picking the East as the most difficult region in this tournament. Why is that? So I've got Michigan, which throughout the regular season, we've argued as you know one of the best teams in the country, you know, a, a 2A or a 2B or a number three. You've got Alabama, a team who I think has a ceiling of cutting down the nets in the final four. They've been absolutely fantastic and they will be tough in a tournament setting because of their style of play. Texas is so hot coming off the Big 12 tournament. We know Florida State could make a deep run based on what we've seen Leonard Hamilton do, taking a nine seed Seminoles team to the Elite Eight just a few years ago. I mean, and then just throw in Michigan State and UCLA, Blue Bloods, the elite coaches with Tom Izzo and Mick Cronin, and oh yeah, here's UConn hanging out here on the seven line. I just think that Michigan got the toughest 
region. And sometimes we see that Michigan was the fourth number one seed. So they get the number one, number two seed, which is Alabama. But then even as we continue to fill it out uh, all the way down to that seven seed UConn, all the way to a Michigan State 11, I just think there's a lot of really dangerous teams in the East Then all of them could take down the Wolverines in a single game scenario. Chip, it is time for the big one, your pick to win the national championship. Now, so far, uh, some of our analysts have picked Gonzaga to win it all, Iowa, Illinois. You are going with somebody entirely different, so tell us who and why. I'm going to be taking Alabama over Illinois in the national championship game. And the reason I'm choosing the Crimson Tide to shout out Gary Parrish once again is he just made the point that if you are going into a game, the last kind of team that you want to play is a team that defends at an elite level and plays at a relentless pace. They're one of the fastest teams in all of college basketball, and they defend at a top 10 level, and they shoot a ton of three-pointers. How many times have we seen Alabama this season? Season, just change the fortune of a game in a heartbeat with three-pointers and with their pace. You know, Georgia jumps out to a good lead in the regular season finale on CBS, and Alabama ends up winning comfortably. You know, Missouri has a huge lead, and Alabama comes roaring back. It's just so many times we've seen games change in an instant because of the style of play. And then to, to put the icing on the cake here, I think it's going to be mentally exhausting to be in the bubble. I think that the team that emerges as the national champion will have to be one that is going to be able to deal with all of the protocols and with everything that goes into an extended stay in Indiana. And Alabama really has baked into Nate Oates' team this blue collar mentality. A senior like Herb Jones, who's used to be just a defensive specialist, he's leveled up in a big way. They bring in a transfer like Javon Quinterly, he's taken that second opportunity. I mean, they brand themselves as blue collar. And so with relentless pace, shooting a bunch of threes, defending well, and then really buying into that blue collar mindset. I think that makes Alabama best set to deal with these unique conditions and win the national championship. Alabama tied as the seventh favorite, of course, the national championship. As you mentioned, they're going to have to be there for quite some time, the better part of a month. Uh, it is Monday, April 5th. Chip Patterson, thanks so much for hopping on with us. You can hear more from Chip and all of our guys. This is the podcast of all the podcasts you want right now on your phone, uh, your computer, wherever you listen to it, the Eye on College Basketball podcast. Right now, you can find a breakdown of each region in this tournament. Let's start dancing. Download and subscribe. Want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.